Texaco presents Miss Ethel Merman. In our modern capitalistic world with centibillionaires and multi-trillion dollar mega cap companies, hostile takeovers are a dime a dozen. Elon Musk just had one last year with Twitter. More times than not though, such hostile takeovers don't actually benefit the company being taken over all that much. Sometimes the acquirer will dissect and keep the desirable parts of the company and viciously shut down or sell off the other parts as was the case with Google and Motorola. Google took over much of Motorola's 17,000 patents and sold the remaining corpse to Lenovo. Other times, acquirers will bury the original company and taint the products that they run with as was the case with Oracle and Sun Microsystems slash Java. In the 80s and 90s, Sun was an IT giant, but today, the brand is virtually non-existent because of Oracle. To make things worse, Oracle annihilated the reputation of Java by trying to sue Google for their use of it. If none of this has transpired after an acquisition, it may just be a successful one, but even then, that's only in the eyes of the acquirer and shareholders. Oftentimes, the original team who founded the company is completely kicked out and robbed, as was the case with both Instagram and WhatsApp. Things have gotten so bad between WhatsApp's founders and Zuckerberg that WhatsApp's founders are literally advocating for people to delete Facebook. The original founders aren't the only victims in such takeovers either. While a big mighty monopoly might be a dream for investors, the same cannot be said about consumers. So in almost every case, hostile takeovers end up hurting the original company, the original product, the founders, and or the public. But this is simply the reality of our modern capitalistic society. However, there are some rare cases in which the brash acquirers get a taste of their own medicine. Such was the case with Texaco and Getty Oil, which was at the time the largest takeover in history. This made sense as Texaco was the sixth largest company in the world, and they were hoping that this acquisition is just what they needed to overtake Exxon and claim the crown as the world's largest company. But little did they know that this hostile takeover would not just be a nightmare, but straight up be fatal. Just three years later, Texaco would file for bankruptcy, and the company has been completely forgotten about since. So here's how one hostile takeover destroyed the entire empire of Texaco. Taking a look back, the story of Texaco's demise can be traced back to the feud of a completely unrelated family, the Getty family. The Getty family was the owners of Getty Oil, which was at one point one of the largest companies in the world. In fact, its visionary founder, John Paul Getty Sr. was regularly listed as the richest man in the world. For example, in 1957, Fortune listed him as the richest man alive, and in 1966, Guinness listed him as the world's richest private citizen. Let's just say this guy was a billionaire back in the 50s and 60s, so he was really rich, but he didn't let this wealth get to his head. He understood how volatile his fortune was and that much of his wealth was just on paper. John was a shrewd businessman who was extremely frugal and obsessed over every deal. In fact, he learned Arabic so that he could personally negotiate deals in the Middle East and not get screwed over by translators. He would also wash his clothes by hand because he didn't want to pay anyone else to do it. Unfortunately though, this mentality did not rub off on his family whatsoever, and this would become painfully evident throughout the 1970s. Getty Oil would take a substantial hit from the 1973 oil crisis, though this was nothing that John couldn't recover from. Something that he actually couldn't recover from though was debt, and this was his fate in 1976 at the age of 83. Getty Oil was mostly family owned, so you would think that they would all join forces and try to protect this family empire. But the reality was that they were all way too busy arguing over who would get control of the fortune. This was the case with everyone except for John's youngest son, Gordon Getty. Gordon didn't really care about the family business. This isn't to say that he wasn't grateful for his wealth, but simply that he wasn't looking to run the company or take it to the moon. Instead, he just wanted to write music and appreciate opera, and funnily enough, that's exactly what he's been doing to this day. 
so you could say that money and power hadn't really corrupted him yet. The rest of Gordon's family was astonished by his nonchalance to the whole situation, so they figured that he would be the most level-headed person to have control of the company. This was a terrible idea. The reason Gordon was so nonchalant about the whole situation was because it didn't concern him. Gordon's ideal scenario was selling off the company, getting a massive payout, and moving on with his life. And this is eventually what he would do, but we'll get to that later. To hand over substantial control over the company to such a guy was simply brain-dead behavior. The family also handed over substantial control to a trusted family lawyer named C. Lansing Hayes Jr. Now, it's not clear how good of a businessman this guy was, but at least he wasn't hopelessly incompetent. This arrangement would take the company through the next six years, but in 1982, C. Lansing would also pass away, which meant that his control would roll over to Gordon. Gordon now had a 40% stake in Getty Oil, but let's just say, he was still as clueless as ever. Now that Gordon had such a large stake in the company, he felt that he was obliged to do something, so he started with trying to address their rock-bottom stock price. You see, the oil that the company owned itself should have given the company a valuation of $100 per share, but the company was somehow trading at just $50 per share. So Gordon decided that it would be a brilliant idea to bring in some external help, but he would walk straight into the jaws of a shark, T. Boone Pickens. This guy was one of the most infamous corporate raiders of all time, and back in the 1980s, this was the number one guy you wanted to avoid as a struggling company. Yet, Gordon would go straight to this guy and divulge a bunch of company secrets. You know how they say that if you have a good experience with a car salesman, you probably got scammed? Well, this sentiment could not be truer with Gordon and T. Boone Pickens. Gordon felt that Pickens gave him really good advice and that it would be a good idea to set up a meeting with the chairman of Getty, Sidney Peterson. Peterson actually went into the meeting with an open mind, but he quickly realized that Gordon had already spilled the beans, and he could see exactly what Pickens was trying to do. So he would instantly force Pickens to sign an agreement that he wouldn't attempt a hostile takeover. Peterson probably left the meeting with a sigh of relief that he was able to cover for Gordon's blunder and stay one step ahead of Pickens. But it didn't take long for Gordon to start talking with yet another shark, the Bass Brothers. Fearful that Gordon was going to leak company secrets to all of Wall Street, Peterson would bring in external advisors of his own in 1983, Goldman Sachs. Goldman didn't know about the distrust between the board and Gordon, so they would make a recommendation purely based on the financials of the company. Goldman suggested that Getty buy back $500 million worth of stock. Given that their stock was trading for half the value of their oil, this was great advice. If they were able to complete this buyback and follow it up with a strong corporate turnaround, they would simply be even richer. But there was one fatal flaw with this plan. If the company followed through with this repurchase plan, Gordon would end up with over a 50% stake, meaning that he can do whatever he wanted without the board. This would be suicide for the company, and this was simply confirmed by Gordon's incoherent statement that followed. He said, quote, What I really want is to find the optimum way to optimize value. So they would go ahead and reject the idea of a stock buyback, but this simply increased the strife between the board and Gordon. Gordon started to feel that the next step for the company wasn't to get external help, but to get rid of the board. And this led to all-out war. All Gordon had to do was figure out how to increase his stake by a mere 10%. And it didn't take him that long to find the perfect target, the Getty Museum. The Getty Museum owned 12% of the company and was led by a man named Harold Williams. If Gordon could get Williams on his side, well then, he could kick out the board, sell the company, and move on. To win over Williams' support, Gordon offered to buy out the shares of the museum at a very favorable price, but Williams didn't want any part of this nonsense. But he would change his mind after a new development. You see, it wasn't just Gordon that was trying to kick out the board. The board was trying to reduce Gordon's influence as well, so they had recruited Gordon's 15-year-old nephew to sue his uncle Gordon into implementing a co-trustee. But this move would also push Williams over the edge. He couldn't believe that the board was leveraging children to push out Gordon. 
so he would agree to help Gordon sell the company. To accomplish this, he would bring in the CEO of Pennzoil, Hugh Litke. Pennzoil wasn't big enough to buy out the entirety of Getty, but they could help Gordon get rid of the board. The plan was that Litke would buy 20% of Getty at $100 per share, which would give him a seat on the board. From there, he could buy out the museum, which would allow him and Gordon to take over the company. This put the board in a super sticky situation. They couldn't outright refuse or accept the offer. This offer was substantially higher than the stock was trading for, so if they rejected the offer, they would open themselves up to shareholder lawsuits. At the same time though, Goldman valued the company at $120 per share. So if they accepted the offer, they would still open themselves up to shareholder lawsuits. The board countered that they would do the deal for $120, but Litke was only willing to go up to $112.50. At this point, the board could have put up more resistance, but that wouldn't have accomplished much. If they turned down Litke, Gordon would simply become even more aggressive and bring in someone else. So with that, all parties would agree to the deal in principle, and it seemed like this is how this multi-year family feud would finally end. But then out of nowhere, Texaco would step in. They said, forget $120, we'll buy everything for $125. We'll buy the public share, Gordon's share, the museum share, everything. This was a win-win-win-win scenario. The board was not only able to sell the company for slightly more than fair value, but they can ensure that Gordon wouldn't get control of the company either. As for Gordon, well, he didn't want the company in the first place. What he wanted was out, so he was happy to take the money and focus on music. Meanwhile, the museum was able to get out of this drama without having to side with the board or Gordon. And as for Texaco, well, now they had a chance at overtaking Exxon and becoming the world's largest company. Given that all parties were ecstatic, the deal would go through in no time. But there was one person who wasn't happy at all, Hugh Litke. Before Getty completed the deal with Texaco, they had already agreed to do the deal with Pennzoil in principle. Texaco was aware of this, but they assumed that Pennzoil would just let it go. In the end, they had put up a good fight and they were close, but no cigar. Texaco had come out on top and it was time for Pennzoil to accept their loss and move on. But Pennzoil had different plans. They had already struck a deal with Getty and it was not only distasteful for Texaco to step in, but a breach of contract and Pennzoil was gonna get revenge through legal means. This was a nightmare for Texaco. They had just bet the farm on Getty. They spent $9.9 billion on the acquisition, which was again the largest in history. This was by no means a small amount for even Texaco themselves. At the time, they were profiting about $1.2 billion per year, so they had basically bet 8 years worth of profit on Getty. And who knows how much debt and leverage they had to use to complete this acquisition. So Texaco had no doubt made a risky bet with Getty. But they felt that if they could just turn around the company, they would be rewarded insanely. This lawsuit, however, threw a wrench in all of their plans. The last thing they wanted to do was fight another oil giant, or worse, pay out billions of dollars to them. Pennzoil nonchalantly wanted a full $10.53 billion, and given that they did have the deal in principle, it was easy for the jury to side with Pennzoil. For Texaco, this was a death sentence. At least with Getty, they were getting an income-producing entity with assets, employees, and reputation. With the lawsuit, the money was just going straight to Pennzoil's bottom line. Texaco would of course appeal and the case would go to the Supreme Court, but the Supreme Court would simply humiliate Texaco. The justices didn't even go as far as discussing whether Texaco should pay. They straight up said that Texaco did not even have the right to appeal this decision and that their claims lacked merit. And with that, Texaco had no choice but to pay. And given that they couldn't pay, they had no choice but to file for bankruptcy on April 12, 1987. Now that Texaco had been completely driven to the ground, Pennzoil would finally ease up. They would agree to a much lower but still devastating amount of $3 billion. Texaco would eventually emerge from bankruptcy, but it was never really the same. They would face a slow decline throughout the 90s before being bought out by Chevron for $35 billion in 2000. 
And over the next decade, Chevron would slowly convert Texaco gas stations into Chevron gas stations or completely shut them down. Despite this, there's still 1,297 Texaco gas stations across the US today, which just goes to show how big Texaco really was. But while you might be able to spot a Texaco on occasion, the brand is effectively dead, all because of a hostile takeover. In the end, Texaco messed with something that they had no business messing with. Getty was a declining brand that was filled with the drama, backstabbing, and ego. But ironically, everyone on the Getty side of things came out really well. The Texaco acquisition made Gordon the richest person in the world, and he's still a multi-billionaire to this day. The board was able to successfully defend the interests of shareholders, and the museum was able to safely exit all the drama. So somehow, Texaco had solved all of their problems, but they brought on a fatal problem for themselves. If their hostile plan had worked out, they may very well still be up there on the Fortune 500 list along with Exxon. But their greed came along with an $11 billion price tag, and they quickly became a shadow of the past. And that's what happened to Texaco. Do you think Texaco deserved what they got for overstepping Pennzoil? Comment that down below. Also, drop a like if you would like to see more videos about corporate drama. And of course, consider checking out our Discord community to suggest future video ideas and consider subscribing to see more questions logically answered. But until then, I'm Hari, and I'll see you guys on the next one.